So it's my honor to introduce Eddie. He needs no introduction, and I welcome him here today. Thanks, Rob. Um, you never know when people are an issue what they're going to say, especially if they know more about you than they probably should. And uh, he was very gracious this morning. Since we're taking a little bit of a walk down memory lane, I want to share with you a little bit of memory of one of my memories. It was reminded me this morning of this memory. Um, we used to have the science room right over, right over there, and uh, Mr. Shoemake was our science teacher, and we were going to dissect frogs. Now, they had these little tiny frogs about this big, and uh, I thought, well, that's dumb. I've got frogs in my pond that are this big. So when I went out early that morning, as the sun came up, and I shot a frog, and I put it in a plastic bag, and I brought it to school, and I stuck it on the back because we were going to dissect it at lunchtime, or right after lunch. That frog, I guess I didn't really kill it, and it started hopping across the back of the room. Yeah. It was not a very pleasant uh, time. I was admonished that never again was I to bring my own science experiments to school. <laughs> Truly, this place brings back a lot of memories for me, and it is true that without <coughs> Reading Adams Academy or Long Crest Junior Academy, I would not be who I am today. So thank you for all of you, and I've seen many of you this morning that were that made it possible for me to come here and supported it, and I thank you for that. Um, and I, I just pray that you will keep this place healthy and strong because we need places like this. We really do. If we can't figure out how to transmit our core values to our younger generations, they are going to go away. If we don't transmit our core values to our younger generations, they are going to go away. And since most of our young people now, 60 to 70 percent, are going to public school, we need to figure out how to do that in a better way. And I think making our school stronger is a good way, in addition to helping those who choose to go to a different place, helping them understand our core values. I believe in the Seventh-day Adventist message. I believe in scripture. I even believe in Ellen White. And you know what? That's, those things are important to me. Not just because I work for the conference, and if I don't believe that, you won't send your tithe, and I won't get paid and all of that. But it's important to me because I believe in what our, what our scripture is trying to teach us about Jesus and about his grace and about his love and about the, the soon coming that I believe is on its way. You know, I'm a fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist. And I never dreamed that I would be 47 years old and Jesus hadn't come yet. But there have been a bunch of moments in my life, and if you know me very well, there have been a bunch of moments in my life where that second coming got a lot closer. And so it is important that we prepare ourselves and make ourselves ready so that when Jesus does come, we can look up into the clouds of heaven and go, there is my Savior and my Redeemer and my God. And I am ready for him to be here. So those are some of the things that Reading Adventist Academy or Long Christian Junior Academy taught me. And uh, it is true that without, without this place, I would probably not be who I am. And I thank you for supporting it and continuing to support it. You know, I have uh, four siblings, three brothers and a sister. And, uh, you know, siblings are interesting because sometimes they treat you with love and kindness and respect and uh, safety. And other times they do things to you that you wonder why they're related to you. Uh, and you wish they weren't. Uh, one of the things that I, as a kid growing up, didn't like was I didn't like doing dishes. Okay? I don't know how many of you are people who like to do dishes, but I don't like to do dishes, even to this day. In fact, I will do pretty much anything I can to not do dishes at our house. Um, and it might be why we have kids, because uh, I hate doing dishes. Uh, one evening at my house, um, we had this rule at our house. My parents, bless their hearts, um, they, they didn't think that a dishwasher could actually get the food off the dishes. And so before we could load the dishwasher, we had to scrub all the food off and then run it through all the different steps, load the dishwasher, and then, then only in the, then would it be safe to, uh, to uh, eat off of after that was done. And I hate doing that. And so one night, uh, my older brother Craig, and some of you know Pastor Craig, he's the director of the Annie Meadows. He came up to me one day and he said, he, or when he, that evening he goes, Eddie, he goes, I got a deal for you. I go, really? What's that? Now, when older brothers say to younger brothers, I have a deal for you, 
Those of you that have older brothers know that it's time to say no and run because that deal probably is not in your best interest. But I was only about seven or eight years old and he was, uh, he was 14 or 15 and I didn't understand that concept yet. And so I said to him, okay, I'll, I'll bite. What, what's the deal? He goes, look, if you'll let me slug you in the arm as hard as I want three times, I will do your dishes tonight. Said, okay, that sounds like a good deal. You can't hit that hard. And so I remember he hauled off and he punched me. And I remember, and, and the other deal was I couldn't go running to mom or dad and tell on him. That was the other deal. And, and he signed that, got that in writing before he punched me. I remember flying across the kitchen and smacking into the wall. And it hurt. I mean, he didn't hold off anything. He knocked me across the kitchen. And I remember running out into my bedroom and I crawled in my, my little room and I shut the doors and I cried for a while and he waited the appropriate amount of time until he thought maybe my pain was gone away and I could tolerate it more. And he came over and he goes, all right, you ready for number two? <laughs> no, I don't want number two. Are you sure? Because you'll still have to do your dishes. Yeah, okay. So I stood up and I remember he punched me again and just knocked me across the room. Again. And I crawled back in my room, shut my old doors. We, I slept in, the, in a closet. Like we had bunk beds in a closet. And I remember sleeping in there and, and I just cried, cried out. And after a while he came and knocked on the door again. Are you ready for the third and final punch before and I'll go do your dishes? Now, he had a pretty good idea of what my, what my response was going to be. He knew that if he hit me hard enough, he'd probably get one or two free hits, and then I'd still do my dishes. And that's exactly what happened. I refused, under no circumstances, to let him punch me again, because I was pretty sure my arm was already broken, and it, it just, it was terrible. So you can understand that I have a pretty good grip on 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you brought your Bible this morning, I'd encourage you to open it to 1 Samuel 17. That's the story of David and Goliath. See, David was the youngest in the family. David was this, this unappreciated younger brother, the youngest in the family. And I think that younger siblings are always underappreciated and over-criticized. And if you're an older sibling, talk to me later. Don't talk to me now. It's probably okay. But... David was the one that was overlooked. He was the one that nobody really wanted to hang out with except, um, except the sheep. And one day his father Jesse came to David and said, David, those older brothers of yours, those big mighty men, those macho dudes that joined the army or that got pulled into the army, he said, I'm worried about them. And so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to load up one of the donkeys with cheese and bread and all the other stuff that your brothers like. And I'd like you to go to the battle, and I'd like you to give them this food. We're in verse 17 of chapter 17. So Jesse said to David his son, Take now for your brothers the ephah of dried grain and these ten loaves of bread, and run your brothers of the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to their captain to their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back the news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp of the army as the army was going out to fight, the, to fight, shouting for the battle. For Israel and Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper and ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Now, here's where the problem becomes. Younger brother, too young to go to war comes to see his older brothers. Now, older brothers, once again, they can be kind of mean. And they're like, what are you doing here? You're not. You, you just go back home and you know, talk to mommy. Uh, we're here to fight because we're important. Now, remember, they had been there for a while already. And they hadn't done a single thing of fighting. But they were pretending that they were soldiers. And the Philistines across the, across the way, they were actually real soldiers. They had spears and they had bows and they had, they had swords and armor and all of that. And, 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 and they actually knew what they were doing. And they were camped across this valley from each other, and they would shout at each other every day because they were working up the courage to fight each other. And the youngest, and, and David, his older brothers, thought that he had just come to sit on the sidelines and watch as the battle began. Well, just about that time, this big dude named Goliath comes out. You might have heard this story before. I hope you have. This big dude named Goliath shows up, and he stands up there. And he says to them across the valley, I'm going to come over there and I'm going to kill you guys. But before I do that, how about we do this? We'll just skip all of that. You send out your best man to fight me and I'll fight him. And if he wins, then we'll be your slaves. And if 
you win the other way around, yeah. We'll, we'll just swap. You'll be our slaves, we'll be your slaves, all those kind of things. You gotta understand something here. Who were the Israelites? They were God's people, that's exactly right. Who were the Philistines? They weren't, they weren't God's people, they were the enemy, that's exactly right. Who was supposed to have been killed when the children of Israel came out of Canaan? Philistines. Who, who wasn't? Who didn't get killed? It was the Philistines. So here what you really have here is you have two things. You have the army of the God of Israel standing on one side being weaklings and chickens. And you have the Philistines over here who worship stone and wood standing up for their God that doesn't even exist. Kind of an interesting concept, huh? The people who had the truth were afraid to speak the truth. They were afraid to trust the God that had brought them out of the land of Egypt and out of the land of Canaan and all of those things. They, they were afraid to stand up there and speak the truth. And the Philistines had no, had no backing except for wood and stone. We're very eager to stand up and say, we have the truth and we're going to wipe you guys out. But I'm getting ahead of myself in the story. Well, when Goliath came out and shouted his taunts about how good he was and how great the Philistines were and all of that, David, who was just a lowly shepherd boy, he was the little guy, he was the guy that none of the brothers wanted to hang out with, he became incensed because he had a relationship with God. He knew who he was in relationship to who God was. He knew what his calling was. And he goes, how dare anybody stand up and say those kind of things against my God? And so he started bragging. Well, I'm not bragging, just saying, look, if none of you guys who are real soldiers are going to go out and fight him, I'm just a shepherd. But, you know, the other day I was out in the pasture and this bear came and he tried to kill my sheep and I killed him. And this lion came and he tried to kill my sheep and I killed him. And it wasn't because what I did, it was because what God did in my all of the, board, the, all the free time I had, you know, with my slingshot. I practiced and God helped me and we took care of this. He goes, I'm willing to go out and fight against that heathen because nobody else seems to be willing to stand up for God. Well... His brothers made kind of fun of him again, and fine, but the word got to the king Saul, verse 33. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go out against the Philistine to fight him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion and a bear came and took out the lamb, I went after it and I struck it, and I delivered the lamb from its mouth when it rose against me, and I caught it by its beard, and I struck it, and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said, David, go, and the Lord be with you. You see, when you have God behind you, when you have God on your side, there is nothing, there is nobody who can stand up in front of you and get in your way. Because the God that I worship, and hopefully the God that you worship, is the God of the universe who is powerful enough to speak and this whole universe became. And when you have that kind of power behind you, there is nothing that can stand in front of you. And David understood that. So David... He tried on Saul's armor because Saul thought it'd be cool if he went out in his armor and had his sword spear. And he goes, no, I can't do that. He goes, i got to fight in my own armor. If you don't have a relationship with God, you can't grab somebody else's relationship at the last minute, put it on and go, okay, I feel this feels good. I'm going to go out and fight. You have to have your own personal relationship with Jesus in order to be able to go out and fight in the name of Jesus. David understood that, so he took off the armor, he took off the sword, he did, took off all the stuff and went out in his shepherd's garb with his shepherd's rod and with his slingshot. And he went to fight against a man who was covered in, in armor from the head, top of his head to the bottom of his feet, who had his own shield bearer. It'd be like going out with a slingshot and trying down to bring, bring down an F-16. Not likely going to happen. <clears throat> So he goes down into this valley, and hopefully, you know, I used to think this was this huge place. It's really not that big a place. I had some friends that were just there, and we, were, we showed me some pictures, and we were talking about it. It's not very big. So David goes down to this to the little creek, and he gets down there, and he picks up five stones. 
Now, I always wondered why he picked up five and not six or seven or eight or nine or ten. I mean, I'd picked up as many as I thought I could get in my bag if there, because there was a few of the those things over there. But as I, if I understand it correctly, Goliath had four brothers. David chose five stones. He didn't just do random things. He, he picked up five stones. And then he goes out and he walks over there and he took his staff in his hand and he chose one for himself. Chose for himself five stones from the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag and in a pouch which he had. And the sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the men who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was only a youth, he was ready and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog? Do you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Remember, there's a lot of cursing about gods here. And the Philistine cursed him about his gods. He said, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the army of Israel, which you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from your shoulders. And this day I will give your carcasses of the camp of the Philistines, the birds and the beasts and the air and the fields and all of that. And here's what he says at the end. He says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. This was not just a battle between two groups of people that were angry at each other, that were fighting over a piece of land. This was a battle between gods. And how often do we enter into battles in our, amongst ourselves thinking it's just a battle of, well, I like red carpet and they like green carpet. Um, that's how some churches got started around here, I remember. I was chuckling the other day. Somebody talked to me and told me they were how wonderful they thought Reading had some new church plants. And I said, do you know how those churches got started? And they were quiet. But we often fight about things that, that we don't understand what we're fighting about. Now is the time to stand together as a united people who believe in the same God, who believe in the same Bible, who believe in the fundamental pillars of the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is a spiritual battle we are fighting. And until we understand that, we are going to be standing on the sidelines until some little kid comes out and fights for us. Or the rocks fight for us. Or the rocks tell the story of Jesus. And how embarrassed we're going to be as we stand there and listen to the rocks telling, what, telling the story that we should have told. This is serious business. It is. So we need to bury the hatchet in some place else other than our neighbor. But I'm digressing. David picks up those, he's, he's, he takes his sling and he puts a stone in it. And he starts going after Goliath, who, like I said, he's covered from head to toe with armor. And I believe it was divinely appointed for a place on that forehead that that rock met because when, when David slung that rock in Goliath's forehead and it struck him in the head, Goliath went down just like that, ended up on the ground. And then I love the I love it. David runs over and grabs the sword, chops off his head, and, and the Philistines went crazy. Had anything changed, really? They lost one soldier. They lost one soldier. Had anything fundamentally changed? No. But the Israelites understood in the moment that Goliath was, was killed. They understood that, that they remembered for just a second that their God was so powerful that he would let a little shepherd boy go out and kill him. And they remembered what their mission was. And they started screaming and yelling and went out and attacked him. And it said there were bodies from, from Dan to Beersheba. They chased him all the way back to the gates of the city and killing him all the way. Now, this is kind of a gory story, I know. But there's a point to this story. Once again, when you trust in Jesus, when you stand up for what is right, God will be with you. And that's a good thing. During World War II, 
if you recall. Some of you might be old enough to remember it. I just have read about it. Um, but during World War II, the Nazis rounded up a lot of people of, of Jewish descent. And they did ugly, horrible things to them. But there was one country, there was one country, it was the country of Bulgaria, that very early on, the church leaders, and when I say church leaders, I'm talking about different denominations, different groups. The church leaders, those, those people that profess to be leaders of the, of, and followers of Jesus Christ, they got together. And they said, are we going to allow Hitler and the, and, the, and the Nazis to come into our country and do horrible things to our people and our friends? And they all agreed that they were not going to allow that to happen. One night in, in a town there in, in Bulgaria, the bells began to ring at the church. Now, that didn't happen very often in the middle of the night because they didn't usually have you know, midnight services. But the bells began to ring and the church members knew that something was wrong. And so they all came into the church, and when they got there, Metropolitan Kirill, their pastor, their preacher, was standing in his pulpit, and he said, tonight a bad thing is happening. They said, tell us about it. He said, this afternoon, just the dark, a bunch of Nazi soldiers came in, and they brought in a train, and they built a pen down by the rail station. And they said, they're going around rounding up the Jews in our town, and, and they're going to take them and put them on that train, and they're never going to come back. He goes, we as Christians cannot allow this to happen. And he said, I believe that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and I believe that, I would, that if Christ were here, he would not stand by and let this happen. And so Metropolitan Kirill said to his congregation, he said, I am going down there with or without you, but it'd be sure good if there were more than just me going down there. Now Metropolitan Kirill was six foot six, he had on a great big robe, he had a big hat on his head, and he said, who's going with me? He started down the street, down towards the train station. By the way, this is a true story. I didn't just make it up for today. They said, he, they said that most people had to run to keep up with him because he was such a big man and he was taking such big strides. When he got down to where that barbed wire fence was, there were already several hundred Jews inside. The SS troopers were standing there with their machine guns, and as he walked up to them, they said, Sir, you can't go here. And he goes, Watch me. And he reached out and he grabbed the barrel of a machine gun and pushed it out of the way. He grabbed the gate. He opened it up. He threw it out of the way, and he and all of his church members went inside. The people inside were crying. You can imagine how terrified they were of the situation, because they knew what was about to happen to them. And Metropolitan Kirill and his church members said, we will not allow this to happen. They will have to take us with them. We will, have, we will go with you, and if you die, we're going to die. But we will not allow this to happen in our town because Jesus has told us this shouldn't happen. In Bulgaria, if history is correct, and if I understood the facts I read properly, not a single Jew was executed by, the, by, by Hitler and his forces. Because the church of Jesus Christ stood up and was counted. The church of Jesus Christ believed what the message of the gospel was. That God loves all the world and he came to save everybody and that wrong should not triumph over evil. They read the stories of the Bible. They read the story of David and Goliath. They read all of these stories and they believed it. This morning, I want to challenge you. Do you truly believe what the Bible says? Do you truly believe that Jesus Christ came down here and was born as a baby who lived and died so that you and I can have life eternal? Do you believe that? Amen. Then, my goodness, why aren't we telling other people about it? Now, some of you are saying, well, hey, that doesn't apply to me. I, I gave at least one Bible study in the last 20 years. Good. I'm glad you did. But don't you think if we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians were out spreading the good news of salvation, all of the churches here in Reading would be full? Don't you think that if we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians had, were doing our job, there would be more people out there who knew about Jesus? I, I know it's kind of a radical suggestion, but it really hit me the other day. My neighbor... Their 25-year-old son committed suicide in their home. 
I happened to be on a trip and I got back a couple days afterwards and you know what? I went over and I knocked on the door and I said, I'm here. And they're like, well, who are you? Because they don't know who I am. I mean, they knew kind of who I was. We've had conversations over the fence a couple of times. But I, I couldn't go into their home and sit down with them and share the love of Jesus with them and share what we understand as Seventh-day Adventist Christians about death and all of that. I went to the funeral, and guess what? The funeral was like this. Hey, I'm so glad you guys knew him. You'll never see him again. Take a lot of comfort in that. Good job. And they took 30 minutes to say that, and then they all sat down. I was a pole. I don't want to beat you up this morning. I'm not trying to beat you up. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is we need to have energy and enthusiasm and passion about the love of Christ and what he wants to do in us and through us and what he wants to do in our communities. That's what our church has been called to do. That's why we exist. And Reading Adventist Academy was one of those places. I can go through. I, I, I did it on the way up here yesterday and this morning. I went through and I looked at all of the teachers and I could go through every single teacher. And yeah, some of them I didn't like so well. Some of them probably didn't like me so well either. But I, went, I could go through them all. And with only one exception, out of all 14 or 15 of them, they all showed me Jesus. In a way. This is a great place. And I just want to thank you guys again for, for the support you give. You gave it, those of you that are old timers, and those of you that are the new timers, the people that are probably, that have been here probably longer than I have been or whatever. But um, those of you that continue to support it, this is a great place. And it, it's a needed place in Reading. So once again, this morning, I challenge you to share the love of Christ with your neighbors. Because Jesus is coming. I believe that. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the only one standing there waiting for him. <laughs>